morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Lynn Vartan, and I'm the director of Apex Events uh, and also teach in the music department, as many of you know. First, I'd like to acknowledge our partners. Um, I love partnerships with Apex, so if anybody's interested in partnering, let me know. Um, we are partnering with an early start for Black History Month, so this is one of the early events for that, and of course, normally celebrated in February, but we couldn't resist this opportunity of having Amadine on campus. And also, our SUU International Film Festival. Um, what a fantastic turnout we had last night for Amandine's film, Speak Up, um, which I'm sure she'll be telling you more about. So just a little bit about Amandine. She is here from France and visiting with us for a few days. Uh, she is an Afro-feminist, activist, leader, actor, TV and film actor, and just we've been so enjoying getting to know her. She has degrees in political science, masters in communication and sociology, and her film, which we have featuring in our festival has just broke all kinds of records and all kinds of boundaries and just has been a really groundbreaking film both in France and now in its US distribu distribution. So again, it has just been such an amazing time to get to know her this week. Uh, other events that are happening today, uh, she will be on the radio with me at 3 p.m. on KSUU Thunder 91.1 and we will also be doing a meet and greet and discussion at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion at 4 p.m. So, Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Amandine Gay. So I'm going to put my timer on so that I don't, you know, go beyond time, and then I'll start. There we go. So first, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I don't know who was here last night and, um, and uh, who came again today. So thank you so much for those who weren't there. Um, I'm going to start with personal location. I always start to uh, present myself and let you know who I am because it will inform a lot of what I'm going to say later on. So first, uh, as you can gather from my accent, <laughs> as has been said, I'm French. So I'm a black French woman, uh, and I was adopted, which means that I grew up in rural France in the 80s, 90s, and then later on, uh, amongst a white family. And that will inform also a lot of the things I'm going to tell you about. Um, one of the other things I identify with is the fact that I'm pansexual. So I'm a queer person, um, and this informs also a lot of my work. All these things inform my work because they put me in the margins, right? Being raised in France, uh, we would say that the norm, uh, what is closer to the norm, would be a white, heterosexual, cis man. So I'm a black woman, and then I'm queer, and then I'm an adoptee. So the further away it took me from the norm, the further away I am in the margins, I get also to have a very close look at what the norm is and how I fit or not in it. And I think that a part and a good part of my work is actually really, you know, uh, linked to this relationship to being in the margins. So today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about Speak Up, my film. And I'm going to explain how this documentary to me, you know, how documentary filmmaking is a tool to reclaim the narrative. And I think that uh, the best way to start this is to uh, tell you a bit about the history of the film, because Speak Up would have never been made uh, when it was the film era. I could only make the film because of the digital era, and I could only make the film because there were social networks. So that's why I'm sharing with you the first tweets I sent, you know, when I was trying to look up for people who would participate in the film. Because Twitter and social networks have been a huge part in me being able to look at black women who would want to testify in my film. So the first tweet, as you can see, is from 2014. So it's also been a really long process. And for those of you who are like, interested in filmmaking, uh, today is also about like, telling you more about how film is not about just creation and being an artist and a lot of like, poetic sides. But this is also about being industrious and hustling a lot, because it will mean raising money. It will mean you know, working and like, running, running for a long time until you can get your work to the public. And that is something you should always have in mind, not just create something and not just, you know, uh, be able to express yourself, but you want to have a public, you want to find those people. And again, that's how social networks help me, you know, they sort of made me. It's because a lot of people were supporting Speak Up and would be then asking cinema owners and be asking also the media to talk about it, that the film got to exist in France and then later on in the world. 
The other thing I'm showing you here is the first conference we held in February 2015. So basically, the film was shot between June 2014 and December 2014. And by the end of this, I thought I need to create a community around the film. I need to get people interested in the film. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna do a conference with women from the film who are gonna be with me speaking up about the history of you know, black women's prisons in the media, in the arts, and we're gonna show some excerpts. So doing this night made it then possible for me to have a following because people would be like, oh, here's the film finished. When is it going out? You know, we would like to know more. We would like to see more. And this community of people were then the people I was able to go to when we needed to do a fundraising, a crowdfunding, to get some money to do the production of the film. So again, thanks to social networks and thanks to uh, the digital era, I could make a film about black women. And I'm talking to you about this because this film is not just, again, cinema. It is an archival work and it is a way for me to mix art and activism. So the next thing I would also like to uh, you know, highlight is how you can sort of like follow, uh, for those of you who are French students, you can like follow the entire history of Speak Up on Twitter because you have like the first suites in 2014 and then we won an award in 2018 uh, at, a, at a Brazilian festival you know, for documentary. And so then you had the women in the film, Mrs. Roots is one of the characters who would then, then just say, for those of you who don't speak French, uh, it started with a treat for from Ophio Negra, which is me, and uh, women, you know, speaking out in a living room. And uh, we are so proud of, of you and so proud of all the people who participated in the film. And I think it's also going to be interesting, you know, in the long run uh, to see how you can create, again, a community and how you can follow how a film has grown from really a grassroots organizing, sort of like, you know, community-based uh, project to a film that will then be screened in, you know, Japan, Germany, uh, the US, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, uh, I'm gonna need to go back in history for you to understand why it's been so important for me to de document black women's lives in France. Because I realized when I was doing the research for Speak Up, that I didn't know a lot of things about black women's struggles in France. I didn't know a lot of things about black women's struggles in the US, but I didn't know a lot of what had happened in France. And my first question was like, what happened? Why do I not know this? You know, what were the reasons why I could not know this? And that's why I started by telling you that the film could be made thanks to the digital era. Because back in the 60s or the 70s, it was not so easy to edit a book by yourself. It was not so easy to make a film and then get it shown to the public. To give you a rough idea, to make, speak up, and then to distribute it, it cost about 40,000 euros. When it was the film era, it would have been about 100,000 euros just to buy film for a two hour feature length. So I would have been never able to make a movie like Speak Up because I would have never had the money. That was one of the reasons why black women's history was disappearing back in the day because they didn't have the means you know, to carry on archives, to document what they were doing. Then I'll talk to you about the Black Atlantic because you know, I've been able to get ideas and be inspired on to how to create and how to fight and how to you know, um, be a, a speaker about what's happening to black women in France because I knew about the history of black women in the US. And I think that this relationship between both sides of the Atlantic is something that is often you know, overlooked and which is also something that people don't realize as a huge historical background. So I'm gonna talk to you about that, how you you know, artists are redefining blackness and archiving blackness throughout, you know, both sides of the ocean. Then I'll talk to you about creation, how's emancipative work, so how you can see cinema as a tool to create empathy, because that's what I see in cinema, you know. To me, you have an opportunity to grab people's hearts and guts for two hours and not let go and make sure that they will identify with the person on the screen. So it's not about just storytelling. It's really about reaching to the hearts to get to the minds. That's how I see it, you know. Sometimes you're gonna have really virulent fights if it's just like an argument that you're being, you know, uh, talkative with someone and you think one thing and they think the other thing and you're not really listening to one another but when you're in the dark you know in a room and then you're listening to people who are just testifying about their lives you have to listen to them 
you know, and you have to find your humanity in them. And to me, that was the main challenge for Speak Up because for a long time as an actress, I was told, you know, ah, oh, but we can't have that many black characters because people won't be able to identify. And what I often say is that I fell in love with cinema, you know, watching only movies where there would be uh, white men as the hero. So if I was able to identify, you know, <laughs> to white men as heroes, why would white people not identify with me? When I create something, you know, when I bring my vision of what's universalism, uh, what's, you know, uh, something that is, is uh, moving, why couldn't the rest of, like, all audiences that are non-black, why couldn't they identify with me? So uh, that is the plan for our discussion. And, um, and then I'll conclude because I want you to sort of like feel, you know, bold and allowed uh, to dream about reaching the cinema industry because it's possible, it's tough, it's long, and it will cost a lot of money, but you can get, get there. And I'm going to give you an example of uh, how to get there. So first, I want to tell you yeah, a story about the historical erasure of black women by showing you a Francophone black woman that I really love. And her name is Paulette Nardal. Paulette Nardal is incredible because in the 1920s, she got to Paris and she was the first French black woman to enter the Sorbonne, which is like a really a prominent university in Paris. And, and uh, she was the first black French woman. And I'm telling you that because the first black woman to enter the Sorbonne was actually an African-American woman called Anna J. Cooper. And again, we're going to see the Black Atlantic there because it's an African-American woman who paved the way for a black French woman to be able to go to the Sorbonne, right? So Paulette Nardal is amazing because she had a sister and they had an apartment and they decided to have a literary salon where they would, you know, welcome young artists, young Caribbean writers, and uh, they would show them Paris. And their idea was to create this sort of cultural hub where all these new young black people who would arrive in the capital to study could meet and maybe create together. And this is what is the basis for what is known as the Negritude Movement. So the Negritude is a, literally, uh, is a literary movement that was created uh, by Aimé Césaire and other writers. But it all you know, was birthed in the salon and the living room of the, the Nardal sisters. So to me, that's a really important path because I only discovered about Paulette Nardal when I was doing the research for Speak Up. So, you know, I was thinking there must have been things about black women in France before. So when I'm making the questionnaire for the film, I have to find out what's been happening before, you know? Because sometimes, especially when you're younger, you think that you're inventing something. But by thinking that you're inventing something, you might be erasing people. You know, if you want to present yourself as being the one to have thought this particular concept or to have told this particular story, maybe you are erasing the work of people you didn't know or you weren't aware of. So I tried to, you know, find black women who had done things before. And I was amazed because what I found out was that Paulette Nardal in 1931 created a literary review with Leo Sajous. And Leo Sajous was a Haitian poet. And they decided to create a bilingual review uh, that was called the Review of the Black World. And the idea was to have black people collaborate throughout the Atlantic. So they would have West Indian writers, they would have US writers, they would have French writers, and they would all collaborate within this review. And this is how they describe the review, and I want to read it to you because I think that it was so avant-garde, right? Um, though, so they said this in 1932 about what was their aim with the review. We want to create between blacks of the world without distinction of nationality, an intellectual and moral bond which allows them to know themselves better, to love each other fraternally, to defend more effectively their collective interests and to illustrate their race, such is the triple goal that will pursue the review of the black world. I mean, that's quite amazing because nowadays we're trying to do that too. Um, like I explained yesterday, there was a problem with an event in France where an Afro-feminist group was trying to hold a festival, but then they were stopped by the parliament and by many politicians, and they were even threatened by, you know, to be um, prosecuted for doing an, eventment, an, an event that was open only to black people. 
and they couldn't raise the money for their event because all the platforms for crowdfunding were close to them because they were trying to have workshops for black women only where they could do uh, things about their hair. So the way that they got the money to do their event was to reach out to a Black Lives Matter chapter in the US and then the Black Lives Matter chapter in the US sent some money. So you can see that today, you know, the Black Atlantic is still functioning. We are still working together. We are still, you know, trying to create together or to support each other. And I think it's really important to know that we were not the first to do it and that it happened, you know, and that it started actually in the 30s. And then just for the anecdote, because I'm really a fan of Paulette Nadal, you need to know that she also uh, created a thing called the Feminine Gathering in the 1940s, because France, French women only got the right to vote in 1944, and so she decided to incite uh, black women in the French Caribbean to go to vote, and so she created one of the first you know, women's-led organization in France uh, for voting. So that's a good thing to know, because to me, when I uh, organized the conference that I showed you the photo uh, to begin with, you know, it was also a time for us to be able to bring back those historical black women's figures and to be like, we are you know, following in their footpath. We want to be grateful for all the women who could not write their history, because that's what happened. They were there, they fought, but at the end of the day, the, what history remembered, for instance, for the Negritude Movement, is not the Nada sisters. Uh, the Negritude movement is only remembered through the men who were the writers who then became famous. So it's been really important for us, you know, like the new generation of black people who are bloggers and writers, etc., to bring this history forward. And we've been doing it through art, activism, and through writing. And I think that it's important to know, especially if at one point in your life you go to Paris, that because we did that, a lot of people followed in our footsteps. And there's this uh, guide, you know, uh, this tour guide who created a tour called Le Paris Noir, so Black Paris. And he starts the tour by telling the story of Paulette Nardal because he wants people uh, to understand how there is a side of Paris that is a black Paris, how it was created, you know, all the arts, all the jazz things, uh, a lot of cultural creation comes from it. So we are passing through those stories. And to me, filmmaking is a way uh, to pass through our history. You know, it's like oral history or audiovisual history if we haven't had the chance to be written in books. Another example that I like to talk about is the story of the coordination of black women. Because up until uh, 2013, I thought that there had never been a black woman, like a black feminist group in France. Because uh, I'd never heard about the coordination of black women, yet I had been an activist in feminist groups, but they were predominantly white feminist groups. So the history of black feminists in France had not been, you know, again, uh, entertained. We had no idea and we had no records. The way I found out about this history is because I was part of a theater group and then I was still doing the questionnaire for Speak Up, so talking about my want to make a film about black women in France, et cetera, my want and need. And then someone tells me, oh, so you must know Gertie Dambury. And I say, well, yeah, I know her as a writer, you know, um, as, a, as a director, but I, I had no idea that she had been part of the coordination of black women, and that's even when I learned about the coordination of black women, so I reached out to her. She's now in her 60s, and that was one of the things I also needed to do. When I created the questionnaire for Speak Up, I really wanted to go and see elders and ask them, you know, what was it like when you were young? You know, how do you identify with the questionnaire? Do you think that the things we're discussing now in 2014 are relevant to what you were experienced, experiencing in the 60s? Is it different? How is it different? Um, sadly, it wasn't very different. But the good thing was that she told me, you know, how their history sort of disappeared. She said, we were many black women in metropolitan France in the 60s, but we were from the West Indies or we were from Africa. So when we finished studying, we went back to the places where we were from to become teachers, to become you know, uh, artists, etc. So nobody was left in metropolitan France to tell their story. And so 30, 40 years later, people like me would grow up thinking that there had been no black feminist group because I had never been you know, introduced to the history of black women's fights you know, in metropolitan France. And I think that's also one of the things that really drove me to thinking that it was more than necessary to have the film because I was too on my way to leaving France.
uh, in 2013, I decided that I had enough, that I couldn't do it no more, that you know my career was not going the way I wanted, that I could, could probably be better somewhere else. So I decided to leave for Canada. And I realized you know, when I was talking to uh, Jerti that I was doing what a lot of other black women had done before me. They had left, but back in the day, they didn't have the means to leave a trace. They didn't have um, the means to leave something for the next generation. So we just grew up thinking that nothing had happened, and we just kept having to start from scratch perpetually. So after that, I asked her to send me a few archives. And so you're very you know, lucky because you can see one of the two, you know, like the rare two pictures of black French women um, you know, demonstrating in the 70s. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm really proud and really happy that um, she, she entrusted me with those pictures. Um, then I can tell you also what drove me uh, to make a documentary because the documentary was about, again, documenting. And I was just sort of like gathering those thoughts about what's happening when history is disappearing, why is it disappearing, what, happen what happens to black women's history. When I you know, read um, what you are seeing on the board, which is the introduction to the Ida B. Wells autobiography. And uh, to give you a, a, a quick summary of what this text says, uh, is the fact that Ida B. Wells realized that she was being written out of history when um, the founding 40 members of the NAACP were to be elected and she wasn't made a part of it. So she realized that even though she you know, was one of the first to do works on lynching and to be really a, a foremost activist in this field, she was just being excluded when big celebrations came on. But the worst part was that at some public event, a younger woman, because by then she was quite old, you know, came to see her and said, I'm sorry, you know, um, I think you've done important things and I know your face, but I don't know who you are and I don't know what you've done. And at that particular moment, she realized that she was disappearing from history and that she had to write her own autobiography, otherwise nobody would know the kind of work she had been doing. And to me, it was really a moment of reckoning where I realized that's what was happening to black women in France, including me. So that was 2015. So I started doing, you know, having a blog. And then I started writing for Slate. So you know Slate.com. Well, there's a French version called Slate.afr. Because my, my idea was, you know, the only way um, to not be erased and to not have our struggles erased uh, is to document them. Because sometimes, if you're you know, an activist, you might be part of a struggle that is not going to succeed. And if your struggle doesn't succeed, it's going to be less likely to be written in history. But you still need to document it, because maybe the next generation will not be ma making the same mistakes. Maybe they can you know, learn from what you've done. So to me, the idea was, OK, now I'm going to do the IWL thing, and I'm going to start documenting everything I do. I'm going to tape the conferences I give in, in, uh, in France. I'm going to write the preface, uh, the preface for the first translation of Bell Hooks, Anti-Women. Uh, and in this preface, I talked about Paulette Nardal, because my idea was that I need to be uh, putting forward all this history that has not been kept. So that this way, you know, at some point, maybe a young black woman will see it, will read it, and will decide to make a master's degree on Paulette Nardal. Maybe uh, someone is going to be looking to rewrite the history of the coordination of black women. So we need to be doing this work, thinking about the next generation, because we might not be able to pursue it, but someone else might pick it up if they know, only know that it existed. So it's all about not disappearing from history by writing, by documenting while you're alive. And that's what led me to speak up, basically. Because if you're documenting while you're alive, well, you're going to document the people around you. And I was living in a country where the representation of black women was something that was really stereotypical. We were presented as a homogeneous group, you know, as if we had no um, specific identity. We would not be presented uh, as a plural group. We would only be you know, in very stereotypical roles, because back then I was an actress, so I would be asked to be, uh, you know, someone going in or out of jail, um, someone who uh, was a drug addict, uh, someone who was a, tripper, a stripper, a sex worker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so my issue was, how can I make things change 
in the French cinema industry if I'm only offered parts that are at the opposite of what I'm fighting for and of all my ideals, but I need to eat. So if I want to be an actress, I'm going to have to do those stereotypes roles and then become the exact opposite of the things that I want to discuss and deconstruct in society. So that's what first drove me from acting to writing, because I thought maybe the problem is with screenplays. Maybe if I get to be writing fiction, I will be able to change the narrative. But that was a bit naive of me because, you know, screenwriters don't have much power. The ones who have the power in the cinema industry are producers. And that's why I told you also about, you know, uh, the need to, to think about it from an industry perspective. Changing the narrative is not just about writing different stories, but it's about having the means to take those stories all the way to the screen the way you wrote them. And that's where I discovered that being a screenwriter wasn't enough. You know, I would have to debate my ideas, mostly with older white male, uh, who would not think that people like me even existed. I gave this example this morning uh, of the screenplay I wrote for a TV series, which was a satire of, um, of women's magazines. So the idea was to take the real title of a, of a women's magazine, you know, for instance, a spanking is so nice, or, you know, uh, how to look 20 years younger, et cetera, et cetera, and then have five characters, five Parisian women, you know, uh, interact with this title and see how it would work for them. And so uh, we started working on this show, and my idea was to write myself parts I wanted to play. So amongst the group of five women, of five friends, I wrote a black lesbian sommelier. So, you know, sommelier is uh, someone who's like uh, really expert in wine. Because, like I told you earlier on, I identify as pansexual, and also I used to be a manager in a wine bar. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll make a part that looks like me, and uh, that way I'm going to get to, you know, uh, play in something that I actually like. And then I would end up having, you know, uh, production meetings with older men who would tell me that those characters did not exist. They would say, oh, well, that's way too American or way too, you know, like you're watching too many Anglo-Saxon series. Uh, so it's really nice. Like we like the idea, we like the concept, but that's something for the UK or the US. These women don't exist here. And I was like, I'm in the room, you know? The show is about me. Uh, it's written for me specifically, so you can tell me that I do not exist. The fact that you don't know people like me doesn't mean we don't exist. But then I realized that I was even more naive than what I thought, which means that the problem was not only about writing and being able to take your vision all the way to the screen. The, the problem was considering that people in front of me had an idea of black women that was not the stereotype. The, the biggest you know, uh, scare or the thing that you know, surprised me the most is that they were not being dismissive as some sort of like ploy to not have me in the cinema industry. They did really believe that black lesbian sommelier don't exist. And then I realized that trying to write fiction for people who don't even know people like me and that don't know that the category black women is actually a very diverse and plural category, then it means that I had no chance writing fiction. My only chance was to do a work that was nonfiction and to sort of present, oh, look, this is 24 very different black women who have very different religions, who have very different sexual orientations, who have different political views. And so we are that diverse. So next time you write something in fiction, just keep in mind that we are not that stereotype. We are at least as diverse as what you've seen in Speak Up. And, and this film is just the beginning, right? It's the first French film uh, that portrays black women, only black women, you know, on screen in French history. It's the first French film that showcases black lesbian. Uh, that's the first time also in French cinema history. So there are many more films that should be done about black women. You know, there are many issues that I haven't been able to tackle in this film. Uh, we don't talk about disability. Uh, we don't talk about uh, class issues within, you know, the, within black communities. Because like those are themes that could be uh, talked about too. But I had to start somewhere. I had to start somewhere to first, you know, let young black women know that they too, you know, could be filmmakers. Let young black women know that what they were feeling was legitimate because when you're in isolation or when you're not represented, sometimes you think, oh, maybe it's just me, you know, or maybe I was too sensitive or maybe, you know, people like me don't exist and so they're right, why should we make a show about something that is an exception, etc., etc. But then when you get to see 24 women on screen 
who share the same experiences as yours, then it breaks the isolation and it makes you realize that no, you are not crazy, no, you are not exaggerating, you know, everything that you've been feeling and experiencing was actually quite real. So I went to documentary and then I, I chose like a very specific type of documentary style which, was, which is called guerrilla filmmaking. Again, it comes from the US. Uh, guerrilla filmmaking is an expression uh, that comes from Melvin Van Peebles' work because in the 70s he made this film called Sweet Sweet Back Badass Song and, um, and he decided to make this film with his own money, which is something you should not do in the cinema industry. You're never supposed to use your own money to make a film. But if you want to be able to tell your own story the way you want to, sometimes you have to use your own money. So that's what he did in the 70s, and he decided to have a black hero uh, who would escape the police. That was like, the main plot of the thing, and that was quite innovative at the, at the time, right? And so he made the film with his own money. He decided to have a crew that would be you know, a mixed crew, which means white and uh, black and Latin uh, crew members. And what he did is that because there were not enough people who had been going to, like people of color, who had been going to cinema schools, etc., he would have them shadow, you know, uh, technical members of the crew who were white so that they would learn on the spot and that when he would keep on working in the cinema industry, he could have diverse crews. So Melvin Van Peebles has really paved the way for many, you know, directors we see today like Ava DuVernay or Spike Lee who have diverse crews, uh, but it it all came from him. And when he was finished with the film, he wrote a book called Sweet Sweet Back Badass Song, a guerrilla filmmaking manifesto. And basically, it's uh, what it says. It's a manifesto on how to make your own film by yourself, take it to cinemas, and, you know, and, and, and work outside of the industry. And that's why I started also by telling you about being in the margins. Because if you want to be part of the norm, you're going to suffer being in the margins. You know, you're going to feel like you're excluded. You're going to feel like uh, you'll never belong. But if you see being part of the margin as an advantage, as a way for you to do the things that you're not supposed to because you're not supposed to be here anyway, then you have an advantage because you're going to do things that people don't do in, this, in the industry. So like I told you, I've used my own money to make speak up. But I've also done something that has not been done in France since the 1960s, which means calling theaters and distribute the film on my own. So basically what happened is that normally in the film industry, your film is produced ahead. So someone like puts the money, you can make the film. And then uh, you have a distributor that comes, that buys the film, and they do the distribution, they take it to theaters. Uh, we made the film on our own. So we tried first to get a distributor to take it to theaters. Uh, but they would not take the film because France is a country in which cinema is subsidized publicly. So if you make your film, you have to make it by the book, which means that you need to get some um, official public uh, subsidies to have some, what they called an agreement, to have like a stamp from the National Center of Cinematography that says that your film has been made you know, within its rule. This particular stamp then allows companies, like distribution companies, to get subsidies again to distribute your film. So because we didn't have the stamp, then the companies would not get money, like state money, to take our films to theaters. So no distribution company would take us. So I already knew, you know, from having been an actress, etc., that if I wanted to make money with my film, I had to be a producer. Because again, as a writer, you don't have most rights. It's the producer that signs with the distribution company. So that's how you're going to make money when you take your film to theaters. Uh, when I realized I couldn't get a, a distributor, we changed the company status and we made it a production and distribution company. And then I started organizing public screenings. Again, you're not supposed to do that because most big festivals, they want the premiere of your film. So be it the international premiere or the friends premiere, but they want it to be the first time it's being screened. But to me, the only way to be noticed was to screen my film so that people would come and we would have packed houses every time. So because we had packed houses every time, then I got some media attention. What is this film that has been you know, self-produced and that is feeling, is feeling theaters and that nobody knows about and etc cetera, etc cetera. so this was my way in because after doing like four or five of those screenings I got about 15 theaters in France that told me that if I was to do a national release of the film they would take it in their roster 
So then I knew I had at least 15 cinemas that would take it. So then I had to find a Parisian cinema that would take it because Paris is a, like France is a really uh, centralized country. So to be counting as a national release, you have to have a cinema in Paris. Even if you're released in 50 cinemas, 15 cinemas outside of Paris, it's still not a national release. You have, to have one, you have to have one in Paris. So that's the biggest challenge, getting a cinema in Paris that will take your film. So I started calling cinemas until I got one that said yes. And so I could schedule a national release date and then call back all the other cinemas who had told me that they were interested in having the film. And at the end of this, you know, this first tour, I got 11 cinemas to agree to release my film, which is in industry numbers, ridiculous, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, no normally, when you release a film, you have about 50 cinemas for the first week, you know? So 11 was ridiculous, but from my perspective, it was amazing, you know, because it was a national release in 11 different cities in France from this movie I had been doing in my living room. So then I spent the entire summer of um, you know, 2017 calling cinemas. And that's why I told you, like, that's the old way. Uh, you call every cinema, you send them your film by a link, and then you call them back and you're like, did you receive my link? Did you receive the DVD? Did you receive my link? Did you receive the DVD? Are you gonna show it? Are you gonna show it? And then you have other people call the cinemas. And that's why I told you that this film was made through social networks. Because what I would do is that when people were to tell me, oh, I wish I could see the film, I would say, well, that's the cinema in your city, and that's their contact. And you know, find a few people. People created face Facebook pages is we want to see Ouvrir la Voix in you know, Nancy or whatever other town in France. And then they would say, look, there are 120 people on this Facebook page, so you have to screen the film at least once because then we're going to fill the room, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this way, I sort of like made, pushed myself through you know, the cinema theaters and the cinema industry, but I could only do it because I had had the example of Melvin Van Peebles, and I knew that in the end, what counts is the public. Because cinema theaters, even if the owners, they don't like the film and they don't like the ideas I'm defending, they do like money. So what you're going to do is that you're just going to be like, look, we had a packed house in the city near yours, you know, last week. Are you really going to pass out on this film just because you don't want to have black women on screens for two hours? And the answer, of course, was no. So that's how we, you know, we pushed through and we made our way to theaters. So that's why I'm talking about the, the Black Atlantic, because most of my inspiration um, comes from from uh, the US or you know, the UK. And I think it's really important, again, to acknowledge where you get your ideas from and how you can you know, expand them. Another uh, film that's been a great inspiration for me is a Canadian film called Sisters in the Struggle that was made by Diane Brand and Ginny Steichman. And uh, it's, um, you know, to my knowledge, the first documentary about um, black Canadian feminists. And it was a great way for me to see that it was possible to make a woman uh, a woman-led, you know, documentary, black women-led documentary, and uh, and have it, you know, sort of like become a, a cult uh, piece, which is definitely their uh, what what they did with this film. And um, I'm telling you this because I think it's really important to have references when you're making a film. You know, documentary references. Speak Up is a Talking Heads documentary. The Talking Heads genre takes its name from Christoph Kislovski film called Talking Heads. Um, and uh, you, you need to have to see it if you want to be a filmmaker and make that type of films because it's the film that started the genre. Uh, we took the editing, you know, uh, style from er Errol Morris's Fog of War. So again, you need to know your cinema history so that you can steal techniques, uh, you can see what has worked for other films and what you can you know, uh, include in your own work. And now I'm going to tell you about how uh, creation and art is a way of retelling stories, even sometimes in a fictive way. I don't know if you know about Marie Scondé, but Marie Scondé is a French writer. And uh, again, she's one of those French figures who left France to have a career. So for a long time, she was a teacher um, in, uh, in a New York university. Um, and, I, and it's also kind of terrible because I discovered uh, Marie Scondé, not in French school, but in American books again. Uh, a lot of my, you know, sort of like emancipation reading has been through uh, US black feminists uh, because many books were not you know, offered to us at school. So a lot of the things I, I read about blackness and a lot of, you know, the, uh, uh, of my, on my path to understanding all these issues was through the English language. 
And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make Speak Up, because it's a privilege to be able to speak another language. And many people of color, and namely black people in France too, well, they don't speak English or they don't have a reading you know, level English that would allow them to have access to some of the thinkers that really helped me, like Bell Hooks, like Angela Davis, and, uh, and so on and so on. So I thought, you know, cinema is really a, um, um, how, how do you say that? It's a democratic way of acquiring knowledge. You know, everybody can watch a film and everybody can learn something from the film. So I thought, you know, the best way for me to sort of like convey those ideas and concepts that I've learned in university, that I've learned through activism, that I've learned through, you know, mastering another language, you know, I can teach, the, teach this back and give this back to my community if I make a film, you know, if I tell this story that way. Um, and I think the reason why I, I, I really like you know, Marie Scondé is that she's even been able to do that with fiction. So I don't know if you know about Arthur Miller's play, The Witches of Salem, but in this play, there is a character, a black character, and she's called Tituba. And uh, in Arthur Miller's play, you know, this character is sort of like really briefly described and doesn't have like much substance. And so Marie Scondé decided that she would create a fictional autobiography of Tituba. And uh, again, you know, that reminded me of the I.W. Wells' autobiography. I thought, yeah, we can either, you know, reclaim our history or we can create new narratives, you know, for characters that have been overlooked. And um, I'm just going to read you a little bit of this because that's one of, the, um, one of the texts that really accompanied me during the making of, uh, of Speak Up. The bare trees looked like wooden crosses and my ordeal did not end. As I advanced, a violent, painful, unbearable feeling tore at my chest. It seemed to me that I disappeared completely. I felt that in these trials of Salem, witches that would make so much ink you know, flow, that would excite the curiosity and pity of future generations and would appear to all as the most authentic testimony of a credulous and barbaric era, my name would not appear as, uh, as anything more than a companion without interest. Here and there, we would mention a slave originally from the West Indies and probably practicing the hoodoo. We would not worry about my age or my personality. I would be ignored. By the end of the century, petitions would circulate. Judgments would be rendered that would rehabilitate the victims and restore their honor to their descendants. I will never be one of those. Condemned forever, Tituba. No, no caring and inspired biography recreating my life and its torments. And this future injustice revolted me, more cruel than death. So to me, this is one of the many ways that an artist has chosen to recenter black women's narrative, including fictional black characters. Um, my aim was to make a film that I wish I could have seen when I was 14 or 15. You know, to have like a group of older women tell me what they had been through and maybe sort of like make me understand what I was going through. I've given this example this, uh, earlier this morning. Um, the fetishization of black women, the sexual fetishization of black women. When you're 14, uh, you might not understand what's being told to you when people call you a panther or say that black women are so hot and so sexy, etc. Especially when you're in a culture that is, you know, demeaning black women all the time or where you don't see yourself, you know, because you're not in commercials, you're not in fictions on television. So this thing that is actually quite aggressive and quite, you know, reductive might even be presented to you as a compliment. And you're 14 and you're not even sexually active. So how would you know if you're like a crazy performer in bed or, you know, and how are you even supposed to know what's expected of you? Because it's not even part of your life yet. You know, this discomfort I felt when I was 14, but I can explain it to you now this way when I'm 34. When I was 14, I did what Marie-Julie explains in the film. Someone came to me and said, oh, you black women are so whatever. And I was like, yeah, maybe, I don't know, you know? And that's the issue. Nobody's like to tell you, no, it's wrong. And you're right to feel ill at ease when someone comes and makes this comment at you, you know? And that's what the film is about. The film is about having this group of person who comes and tell you, okay, you're okay to feel this, you know, and this is what's happening. You know, you're sort of like getting ahead of time because somebody's telling you that it's okay to feel the way you feel, and they're also giving you the answer to why you're feeling discomfort. 
another creator that has been really important in my life is Toni Morrison, and I think she's been important to quite a few people. And what you know, she's told me through the, the quote that you can read here is that when you are a minority, you are in this forced conversation with the majority group all the time. You know, that's also what Dubois called the double consciousness. You know, you have to deal with what white people think of you so much that it becomes a conversation that you cannot ex escape. And to me, making Speak Up was the first time I allowed myself to make this conversation stop. Speak Up is not a, a documentary addressed to white people. Of course, it's a film that describes the experience of black women in France, so the experience of black women as a minority. So to an extent, it does talk about what it's like, you know, what f white France is like. But to me, it's really different to make a film that I address to young black women, and so I'm trying to give them hope, I'm trying to give them an education, and so it is quite different to do this than to make a film where I want to show white people right, what, what racism is to white people, you know? And I think that having the ability to escape this conversation, having the ability to create something and to create an art that's centered on yourself is also a first step for emancipation, you know? Uh, it's about decolonizing your mind, if you want. Having the, the constant conversation with the majority group means that, to an extent, they are central in the way you see yourself. But if you're able to remove them for the time where you're creating and you're writing, then you're creating your own aesthetics. And I, I you know, picked that up from Toni Morrison, but I could you know, talk about Spike Lee and all these people and um, Usman Samben, all the, all the black creators, all the black filmmakers who really were insistent on the form. You know? uh, Speak Up is a film in which the form has been developed. The aesthetics of the film are really important. They're really important because, you know, usually, again, when you're part of a minority, you're expected to do pedagogy, to explain things. And it's, it's okay, you can do that. But you're not expected to be a creator, someone who, who proposes new aesthetics. And to me, aesthetics are part of emancipation. It is when we're able to see ourselves in a different light and to not be having a conversation where we're trying to show that we are human beings, et cetera, et cetera. But we, when we are just coming from our own humanity, and like I told you, wanting to create empathy, you are the one who have a problem if you're not able to identify to the women on screen because they're human beings talking about their lives. So if you have like something that is not coming to you, then you have to have an exa examination of who you are and how you interact with others. Um, so Tony Morrison was really uh, good in my, in my you know, learning to how to decenter whiteness and make a film from young black women. It doesn't mean that other people can't come and see it, but it just means that when I'm making it, I'm thinking about this particular audience, and that sort of really shifts the tone and the feel of the movie, you know? Because if the last part of the movie is called All Is Not Lost, it's because I do want those 14, 15, 16 years old to leave the theater thinking that, of course, it's going to be tough, but they have a chance. You know, They can make it. And now that they have all this information, all this knowledge, they will be able to fight back. And also, they will be able to maybe make a film. Because of course, what I want is to see more black women you know, entering my industry. Because the more we're going to be, the easier it's going to be to tell our stories and to show how diverse it is. When there's only you to make a film about black women in France, it's really limiting. Because of course, you can't include all the narratives. And so every, you know, there's always going to be someone who's going to be frustrating, thinking, oh, you haven't talked about this in the film. You haven't addressed that. But if there were even just 10 of us, making movies, you know, we could do everything and we could even not be political, you know. To me, like the real emancipation is when you can actually make a movie, I don't know, like a rom-com. I would really love to be able to make a rom-com at some point, but because we are, you know, in the middle of all those political fights, we have to be activists within our work. And I think that in the long run, that is also something to deconstruct, at least for me, I'm really looking forward to the time where I'll be able to just do, you know, creative fiction uh, again, you know, I don't know, a musical, something really light and not necessarily have to address political issues head on all the time. And one of the last, you know, a black Atlantic figures that has really accompanied me is Audre Lorde. And again, Audre Lorde's work is really a work that will 
teach you how creation and narration are places uh, that allow you to resist, you know, how your existence is a way of resistance and how creating your own identity is the first step to address all the inequalities in societies, you know, not let the outside world define you. And that's also why I told you when I started that I was an adoptee. Growing up in rural France in the 80s with my brother who was the only other black person I knew, you know, in a 3,000 inhabitants village in France, meant that my experience of blackness was only an experience of negativity. I would only have people, you know, calling me names or not wanting to hold my hand because I was black, etc. But I did not have a black culture that would support me, you know, in the meantime. So for a while, I would be, you know, having some sort of like identity crisis until I realized that I had an opportunity to define my own blackness. So I, I was not, you know, forced to just be defined by others and by what people would say about blackness. I could just go and look for what I was wanting to build about my own blackness. So I could go look for books, I could go look for music, I could go look for, for films, and this way, create myself in a positive way in the sense that it was not coming from just slurs from the outside or stereotypes from television, but it would actually come from the choices I had made within to connect to black people, you know. I, I started doing, playing basketball because the doctor in my family told my parents that maybe it would be a good idea to put me uh, play basketball because I was tall, but I think it was also because I was black. And you know, and it was a good idea in the end because I then got detected, you know, uh, by, um, so there are a lot of, you know, you can go to tests and see uh, if you're gonna do well or not in one sport. So then uh, a team from the city uh, asked me to come and play with them. And suddenly I was able five days a week to be with black people or North African people because in the city, in the suburban part of Lyon, uh, my team was only made up of people of color. And this way I could interact with people of color, you know, as a teenager and again, build my blackness through their own culture and not through what, you know, the majority group would send back to me. And um, one of the things that I really like about Audrey Lord's work is that it's, she's always you know, uh, pushing you forward to think about change in a long-term perspective. You know, um, sometimes we hope that, I don't know, we're gonna demonstrate about something and then it's gonna change straight away. But I think that if you address things in the long-term perspective, then you're gonna be less likely uh, to feel you know, tired by the struggle. To me, the idea is that I make this film and I know and hope, but I do know that in about 10 to 15 to 20 years, there are gonna be young black women filmmakers who say that they realize that they could be filmmakers because they so speak up. And that's the time it's gonna take for us, you know, to permeate the, black, uh, the, the French industry, the French cinema industry. And that's how you gotta think about it in my way, you know, is that you can be part of the change if you address, recognize, and bring forth what has been done before you, then if you also try and reach out to the people and the generations around you, and then you keep creating a body of work, it's your body of work that will ultimately make it possible for people to see how you know uh, your group, your community has progressed, how the representation of your community that you have proposed has made it change. And I think that you know you can do that in arts, but you can do that in other fields. I just saw a documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and that's exactly what she did with with lawmaking, you know, her idea was that to have gender, you know, um, to have uh, gender equality laws, that she would build a body of laws that would later on, you know, uh, really influence American legislature. And I think that's a, a good thing to keep in mind to have, you know, a long-term strategy. And now. I'm gonna tell you about my strategy to hijack the French film industry. Because like I told you, I got into theaters because you know, I had a public supporting me. But the place where I had trouble going was the French film industry because the National Center for Cinematography uh, you know, wouldn't want to subsidize my film. But most importantly, the program in which I'm part of, the reason why we're seeing each other you know, uh, today is because there is this thing called Young French Cinema. And Young French Cinema is a program that was designed by Unifrance, Unifrance being the institution that promotes French cinema abroad. And so what happened was, you know, very fortunate for me, is that Richard Brody, which is a great, you know, cinema critic from The New Yorker, he made this piece 
about French cinema that was great because it was a takedown. And basically, uh, he used a, a, a documentary uh, called Le Concours. So it's, um, it's like uh, the test, if you want. Uh, and it's a documentary about La Femis, which is one of the most prestigious public French cinema school. And uh, he, said, uh, he said that uh, no wonder that French cinema was kind of dying, because when you saw that documentary, you would see that uh, you know, the, the French cinema schools are the reasons uh, you know, young French directors are so bad. So his article sparked an outrage in France. You know, everybody were like, how does this American say that our cinema is dead, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, a lot of us, you know, uh, filmmakers of color were so happy because it was coming from the US. So when it comes from us, right, it's just that we are this group of people who can't uh, really sort of like succeed in the industry. We are bitter, we are annoying, but then it came from the US. So it was no longer us. So quite a few of us were like, yay, look at what's been said in the New Yorker, you know, how do you want to address that? And, um, and I thought also that it was a great opportunity for me because I agreed with Richard Brody, uh, as far as white French cinema was concerned, a lot of interesting things were happening in the margins. So young French cinema was not dead. You know, it was just like young, white, and really institutional cinema that was dead. So I decided to write to Richard Brody on Twitter, and here we, all, we go again with social networks. Um, and, I, and I did this. So he, he made this first comment, so his article about you know, uh, the dearth of innovative young French filmmaking. So yeah, it really did piss people off in France a lot. And so um, I started writing to him and I say, I really, you know, like this article, but um, I wish you could do a follow up that centers filmmakers of color. And then I talked to him about this book that's been edited by a friend of mine, Claire Diao. She's been doing a lot to, you know, um, have, you know, French uh, short fictions be screened throughout the world. And uh, she made this, um, this uh, book because, you know, the French New Wave is a, is a, is a well-known cinematic movement. So she called the book Double Wave so that to show that there was something happening in the margins, even if it was not really acknowledged, you know, publicly. And um, so I, I told that to Richard Brody, and then he answered. He said, okay, that, was, that he was gonna seek out the book. And since I had his attention, I decided to try my luck and say, hey, I made a film. Uh, <laughs> would you like to see it? Um, and you know, told him that it was self-produced. And then I put the link to an extra, being like, you know, you can start to have a look about it so that he would you know, agree to watch the film. And, um, I told him how you know, the article really pissed the industry in France. Um, and so you know, I went on for a little while until you know, he reached out to me in DMs and said, well, this is my email, send me your film. And first, you know, I was amazed because in France, you know, such a famous critic would have A, never answered, and B, never given me his email. You know? So I was you know, beyond happy. And, um, and so I did uh, send him the film. And this was in July 2017. So um, he watched it, and then he said, "Well, tell me when you have a distributor in uh, in the U.S., and I'll, you know, and I'll and I'll make a, a review of the film." So I was so happy, but I didn't have a distributor in the U.S., and then I didn't get picked up for Young French Cinema in 2018. But he really did like the film. So what he did, he actually used a law that was passed in France in, in the summer of 2018. And this was the law that would you know, take out the word race from the constitution. In France, we have a lot of trouble to address racial issues because race as a social or historical co construct has not been you know, deconstructed. So when you say race or you use the term race in France, people still think you are you know, talking about biological races uh, like in the 18th century. But if you take the word race away from the constitution, and if you refuse to address racial issues, how can we then, for instance, um, advocate for anti-discrimination laws if we can't even you know, address race as a, as a social concept? How can we define our experience? And so what uh, Richard Brody did is that he used that law that was just passed to make the article that I showed you earlier about the film, which was a raving review. and. Um, 
And he said the following thing um, that was really interesting because it was also just after the whole controversy about, you know, the black French, uh, well, I mean, the French soccer team, even I did it, but that was mostly made up of black men. And that, you know, again, uh, was a big controversy in France. So here's what he said. He said, black French men were on the world stage during the World Cup, as they have been every four years for several decades. Black French women aren't on that stage. And for that matter, they haven't been conspicuous on the French cinematic scene either. One actress interviewed acknowledges that the range of roles for black women is narrow and stereotypical. I feel like I can't refuse roles that I'm offered because I either change jobs or direct my own films, she says. That is exactly what Gay has done with Ouvrir la Voix. It is both a vital film in itself and a virtual kit for the inspiration of other filmmakers. It's an opening of voices and of paths. And that article opened me in the past to young French cinema because the day after it was published, I got a text message from the president of Unifrance who told me, Amandine, this is amazing. These movies that get more recognition outside of France than inside, et cetera, et cetera. And because you know, people of color tend to be a little you know, submissive when they finally get accepted in the industry, um, I decided to go straight for yet another bold move because in the meantime, I had been uh, programmed uh, for a cycle at um, Columbia University called Blackness in French and Francophone Film. So when she wrote to me, I knew that I was coming to the US in November. So I said, oh, well, I'm glad you like the article. I'm coming to the US in November. And I heard that Unifrance is paying you know, business class tickets when you go to uh, show your film you know, <laughs> in another country. So how does that work? You know, how do I get a business class ticket? And she said, uh, well, it's only if you have a distributor. But if you were to be selected in the Young French Cinema program in 2019, which is more you know, highly likely to happen, um, you know, then we would take care of your tickets. And uh, that's how I got here. So <laughs> all this to let you know uh, that you know, making the film, taking it to theaters might not even be enough to make it in the industry, but you need to find strategy and you need to push those doors and you need to you know, take down those walls uh, because that's the thing. If you're thinking in terms of long-term strategy, uh, if I want young black women to make it in the industry, well, I need to have a spot that goes beyond the, oh, this sort of like epiphenomenon, right? Oh, she took a film to theaters, oh, that's very nice and now let's forget about her. You know, because I got to do things outside of France and because I got this review from Richard Brody, um, then I could no longer be denied and I had to be included in this program that takes, you know, French cinema overseas. So that was my way of uh, concluding on a, on a happy note. Uh, it is tough, but you can do it and you should do it. I hope there are some aspiring filmmakers here uh, because we really need to hear diverse stories. Uh, we really need to have as many points of view on the world as possible. And uh, we really need to find strategies to get in industries that don't necessarily want us. Thank you.